<clears throat> Welcome to the May meeting of the San Francisco Ethics Commission. Take the role of Vice Chair Andrew. Here. Commissioner Hayden. Here. Commissioner Herr. Here. Commissioner Keene. Here. All are present and accounted for. And again, I apologize for the delay. And the call item number two, public comment on matters not, re not appearing appearing or not appearing on the agenda that are within the jurisdiction of the Ethic Commission. Do we have any public comments? Can you hear me? You can hear me? Thank you. Uh, Joe Kelly Jr. is my name. I, I wanted to just um, see if any um, discussion? I didn't see anything in the agenda regarding the um, possible action regarding forfeiture letter sent to Supervisor Mark Farrell from last month's that, meeting. That was continued to the June fifth meeting at the request of of uh, the complainant's attorney, whose brother died and had to go to a funeral, which was occurring today so that we it continued it to that date of June 5th. Correct me if I'm wrong, but the action that would have perpetuated the issue, I understood to be something that staff was going to be working on rather than, I, I could be wrong, but I, I thought staff was going to return with some revised document. And that is on the agenda for the June 5th meeting. Okay. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> All right. Larry Bush from Friends of Ethics. Since you are putting that on the June 5th meeting, I'm only going to ask that the discussion also include whether or not the statute of limitations apply, because that was the issue that was raised in the last Ethics Commission meeting. Yes. Uh, and so I'm wondering if you're going to have an opinion from the city attorney or from uh, others as to whether or not the statute of limitations continue to toll or if it does not in view of, for example, the city's position with the police department where they dismissed the charges against the officers because, uh, but, but the city argued that it should not be dismissed because once something was in process, the toll cannot be suspended. I hope I was clear on that. <laughs> Any other public comment? Returning item number three, discussion and possible action on a matter submitted under chapter three of the Ethics Commission regulations for violation of the Sunshine Ordinance. Attachments, memo to the commission, hearing notice, staff report and recommendation attachments, response from complainant, response from respondent, letter from city attorney, letter from David Pilpel, Letter from Paula Dutch, ethics complaint number 03-150127. And as you'll recall, uh, the commission, uh, this matter was before the commission at the April meeting. Uh, the April, the commission dealt with one aspect, but it was continued to, uh, the second aspect of it was continued uh, for uh, this meeting, and I guess, uh, Mr. Chair. Yes, Mr. Keen. Uh, Commissioner Keene. The, the, the chair will recall that at the last meeting I asked to be recused from this matter, yes. and the uh, commission recused me, and so I will uh, go ahead and leave the dais. I did want to just make one point uh, and put something down of record, uh, and I don't mean to influence in any way anything that's occurred, but I think I, I just should make this net. Since the last meeting, on my voicemail at the law school, I have had eight phone messages from Mr. Ms. Dadish. 
Uh, I, I don't know what they were because as soon as I recognized her voice, I deleted it and I didn't listen to any of them. So I have no idea what those were. I don't say this in any way to prejudice her or anything like that. I just wanted to make that a matter of record since I am indeed recused from that. I, I thought it was proper to do that. And perhaps the chair might um, indicate that that's not a good idea. Uh, if, with that, I will take a seat in the audience. All right. I believe, uh, Commissioner Hur, you had asked, uh, in a sense, to have this matter, uh, whether or not we could look at a, the email that was in question, that whether or not uh, it, it was properly withheld, and uh, whether or not uh, the uh, conduct of, of the respondent was such that it waived whatever privilege might exist. And uh, as I understand it, uh, the complainant is not here tonight, but she, she has agreed that we could go ahead with it. Is that correct? Yes. And I believe that the respondent is here, is she not? Yes. Uh, do you have you has has the have you looked at the email? I, I have. Uh, thank you, Chair Rennie. Um, and the city attorney provided a memo uh, explaining why the commission was able to review the email in camera. Uh, my view after reviewing the email is that we should find that there was not a violation of section 67.21B. I, I believe that evidence code 1040 and 1041 provide privileges and that this uh, email was properly withheld. I don't think it was accurately described by Ms. Datish. Um, and although we did find a violation of 67.27A for failure to provide the reasoning and that stands, I, I would recommend that we find no violation with respect to 67.21B. Any second of that recommendation? Second. All right. Public comment? Good evening, David Pilpel, speaking as an individual. Um, two points. Under page eight of the commission's regulations for handling um, allegations of, excuse me, the regulations for handling violations of the Sunshine Ordinance, page eight, chapter three, section one A, matters heard under this chapter. Um, there are three circumstances under which um, you hear chapter three allegations. Uh, one. Um, is uh, an allegation of a uh, violation by an elected official or department head. Uh, two is if the district attorney or attorney general take no action for 40 days um, following an order from the supervisor of records or the task force. Uh, and three is if the staff initiates a complaint. Um, I don't believe that any of these uh, three uh, conditions were satisfied here. I've spent some time looking at this and section 67.35D of the ordinance. I think the closest thing is um, 1A2 here, um, but there's no evidence uh, before the commission that the complainant uh, sought an order from the supervisor of records or the task force um, and that subsequently that the district attorney or attorney general took no action for 40 days. So you may choose to take the action uh, proposed, but I think again, that the complainant didn't satisfy the conditions necessary to bring this before you. And even if you're suggesting that it was a close call and you're choosing to hear this, I think it's a bad precedent for the commission to say when we don't clearly have um, authority to hear a complaint, we're going to do so anyway. I think that's just a bad idea in general. Uh, I, I do concur I think with the motion, if, if you're going to take that, uh, to not find a, a further violation. And uh, to the extent that there was a memo uh, from the city attorney that was referenced both in the uh, staff report and uh, by Commissioner Herr, I'm certainly interested in that. I would ask you to either waive privilege and make that uh, memo available or ask that um, it be recrafted in a way that can be made public. I think the procedures by which this commission conducts such an in-camera review of a document 
are of public interest. This hasn't happened before, in my knowledge, um, and I think it would be very interesting to see what uh, logic and, and procedures the city attorney suggested in coming to that conclusion. So I'd be interested, and I make a request that you either waive privilege or ask that the document be recrafted and made available as a public opinion. Thank you. Other public comment? Hearing none, uh, I'll call the motion. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Hearing none, the motion is carried for O. And Commissioner Keene, you can resume your seat. Uh, item number four, discussion and possible action on executive director recruitment process. And attached uh, was the recruitment proposal that was sent out by HR, and I believe also is a uh, you've received a copy of the one response which HR received to that proposal. Uh, they sent it out to uh, six uh, vendors who had previously been vetted by the city and who uh, had previously provided recruitment service and received and gave them a return date of uh, the 26th, uh, and the one response from Alliance Resources Consulting LLC was the only one received uh, and no indication uh, as of the 26th that uh, the other, any of the other five uh, intended to respond, although it may be possible that there was one who uh, would consider it uh, if we extended the time. Uh, I think first we should deal with uh, the question before we get to uh, the recruitment process itself and the recruitment proposals with where we stand, uh, Mr. St. Clair, on the budget question. Excuse me, uh, Chair Rennie. I just want to say for the public record that I'm going to step away from the dais for this for oh, this matter. Fine. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> um, so we have identified um, and have begun encumbering eighteen thousand three hundred and eighty-three dollars for this expense. Um, if I noticed in this proposal, it's twenty thousand. The additional sixteen hundred that would be necessary, I think, could be found out of the budget in the fiscal year that starts in July. So nearly all of it has been, is, is in the process of being encumbered. So that, that at, at least as of today, the firm, we firmly have 18,600. 18,400, yes. 400, I'm sorry, 18,400 uh, that can be uh, dedicated to <clears throat> paying for recruitment services. Correct. Uh, okay. Is there any discussion on the budget uh, question as to uh, whether or not we ought to consider spending that amount of money or not spend it one way or the other? I, I would, I, I would uh, submit that we uh, – this is informative to see their proposal come in, uh, and it's nice to know that we have the money – to, uh, identified to spend on it, but that ultimately doesn't mean that that's where we will land. Um, even that proposal will move forward with a set of negotiations that could bring that number down. Uh, so I, I, I'd like to take it a little slower and just step by step to say, are we comfortable that we are moving forward in this process? We agree that we are going to move forward in this process to to. to um, have a recruiter and then from that that we are comfortable with uh, identifying no more than 20,000 or would we like to have a discussion around capping it at 20,000 because if we entertain the other proposal and it comes in at 25 but it also looks like that they could provide uh, more robust services we would have to go back and revisit that again so I think that we want to have a bit of a separate discussion on how much we will pay for that will allow us to uh, tailor a uh, set of services 
that whether that we could compare apples to apples with either one, with certainly with one, but possibly with two. Twenty thousand. Uh, Commissioner Hurd. So, I, I do think we talked about last time the, that it would be probably beneficial to have a search firm help us. Uh, I agree with Commissioner Andrews that you know you, you guys the chair and the vice chair should talk to them and vet them and if you re you think this is the right firm to use then i have no problem with the proposed expenditure uh and like commissioner andrew said if the, if another proposal comes in and you all recommend that one instead then i think we should revisit at the time but but on the macro question of should we use a search firm i think if we can if we find one that's suitable that we should So is there any other discussion on just the question of whether or not we ought to retain a search firm uh, and within a budget, possible budget limitation of $20,000? Or twenty five, as I think oh. the Commissioner Andrews indicated that in the vetting process, if the two of you saw some reason that a $25,000 amount would be appropriate given the needs that go for the 25. I, I, I don't think we need to really just say 20 or nothing. Uh, I'd, I'd go for the discretion between the two of you that Commissioner Andrews suggests. Keeping in mind that I, I also certainly have my fiscal hat on and I don't want to put undue pressure on <clears throat> on um, Jack in managing his budget year over year uh, so that I want to, we should stay in close contact uh, with Mr. St. Croix on what other identified funds you could have up to 25, uh, but certainly it looks like, I mean, we would want to hear from the executive director because it is, while we have, the budget is approved, he's managing it day to day. So I would not want to spend money that we just don't have. I, I, I think I agree, though, with Commissioner Keene. If if you if you the both the, the two of you determine that you know really uh, there's another search firm at twenty five thousand, I would hope that it would come back to us and we could okay. we could discuss it. Uh, my question is, uh, what is the going rate for a search firm these days? I can. I mean, do we know uh, what the standard? Um, uh, rates are for, the, the, for this? The HR people have said that the proposal that is submitted by Alliance is consistent with the dollar amount for doing the kind of work that they've done for the city in the past and that, uh, and that there's probably negotiating, negotiating room depending upon the scope of the work uh, and that some other search firms may be higher, uh, but I don't think there's anything other than, than saying the HR's belief was that these numbers are consistent with what their experience is for the kinds of work they're offering to do. Uh, my other question has to do with the timeline um, of finding candidates for the job and how long that takes and how long we would like it to take and how does that affect the fees involved? I, I would say that that's just an ongoing discussion that we would have with the firm that we select. And these proposals, what they put forward are based on the information that we, the data points and information that we give them, it's still, there's an X factor that is a moving target. Sometimes they do a full search and they come back with nothing and have to come back at it again. And that's a conversation that we would have up front as to what, what we would do in, in that partnership moving forward. Uh, a lot of times, and you, Commissioner Hayon, you would know this, that some, some uh, uh, fees are based on a percentage of the base salary of the uh, of the candidate, so, which is usually runs between 20 and 35 percent of the sal of the base salary, um, but it looks like this one's a slightly different. I don't think we're 
that, that could be a part of the consideration, but I, I have a feeling other considerations are, are a part of this particular proposal. So um, to your question, we would, we would simply pose that to them, to say if you're going to do a first round of it and the first round turns up nothing or one that's, or two that just don't fit, what would we, uh, what would we do moving forward? And are there fee, uh, other fees attached to that? Because it is a very specialized area. Is there, it, but I take it that there's general consensus that we should retain a, cert, a recruiting firm. Yes. I suppose that should be put in the form of a motion so that's a decision made by the commission that it wants to retain uh, a recruiting firm. I, I would add the caveat, presuming that the chair and vice chair find one that's suitable. I mean, if you have one proposal and you don't like them, I'm not, I don't think we should be committed to, to using them. Well, we that's the second step. I just, I just want to know that, that there's con agreement, and before we vote on it, we'll have public comment, on, but there is agreement that the way to proceed is with the recruiting firm. Right. If, if you can find one that you like. Public comment. Larry Bush from Friends of Ethics. As I understand your, your, the stage you're at now is not just to obtain a recruiting firm, but to have that process done by HR. Is that correct? By what? HR. Finding the recruiting firm? Yes. It's well, HR is putting out the, uh, the, the proposal. Correct. But I'm not sure that that's the outfit that you want to conduct a search for a recruiting firm. They seem to have developed a, a proposal that they have sent out that you've are got one response on that's based on salary structures from some other city departments but not compared to other ethics commissions. For example, Los Angeles has about the same budget and the same staff, but they pay $200,000 a year for their executive director. It's going to make it harder for us to recruit if our salaries are much lower and if there's not a good reason for our salaries to be lower. And secondly, the proposal that they've put out that for the firm that you would have in charge of soliciting uh, search firms is, uh, in our view at Friends of Ethics, very what? inadequate. Very inadequate. It, it fails to deal with most of the key functions that have been added to the Ethics Commission. It fails to take into account that the Ethics Commission's duties have changed substantially. And essentially, what it has in a one-page thing is a continuation of the way things are now. And that's not the way that, that's not the kind of search that needs to be undertaken at this point. That's our view. All right. Any other public comment? Good evening. Um, I'm Robert Van Ravensway. I was on the civil grand jury 2013-2014. <clears throat> I'm just going to re respond to the discussion of the budget. Um, in the proposal that you have in front of you, which basically is a boilerplate proposal that just took some language from the HR announcement, they talk about a professional fee of $20,000, but they also talk of expenses that could be as much as $8,500. And they also caution you that in terms of bringing candidates in for interviews, they're assuming that you're going to pay for the uh, travel expenses. And that's what it says in the proposal. So, you know, I, I, I just suggest you take that into account as you consider the cost. Of, uh, of doing this. You know, at the same time, uh, I think what Commissioner Andrews says, I'm, I, I'm used to search firms charging a good deal more than this in the private sector. So, thank you. David Pilpel again, speaking as an individual. Um, I'm also reviewing the uh, Alliance proposal that's only been available less than an hour here. Um, and I, I read the same information that Mr. Ren, uh, Van Ravensway uh, read, 
which suggests that the total cost might be up to 28500 I would encourage you to um, authorize either the um, selection committee or one of your officers to perhaps negotiate with the uh, firm or any other firms that, that might submit um, and discuss the, the scope of work. Their outline and proposal suggests a, a process to me that isn't a San Francisco type of process. It doesn't suggest that they've done any recruitment um, for the city, but for other communities in California, it suggests that they uh, use technology extensively, but doesn't make clear uh, where the records would uh, reside following the search, perhaps that they would keep the records. I think it's important for the city to retain uh, the records uh, from this search. Um, so I think there are some issues with their um, proposal and their uh, approach and perhaps the uh, cost and um, billing schedule uh, that ought to be negotiated. So I don't object to a search firm in concept. That was discussed uh, last month. But I think the specifics of how this works are very important, um, both to the commission and to the public in, in making this process uh, work. So I'd encourage you to um, consider those comments. Thanks. As to, as to your observation that they haven't done work for the city, the HR department has advised us that they did the search for the civil service commissioner in this city. They did two searches for the uh, controller's office uh, deputies uh, and one other. You recall what it was, Andrew? Yeah, so this afternoon the DHR did inform us that they've done three department head searches within the last two years in the city, the first being the head of the civil service commission, the second being the new department head for the Department of the Environment, and third being the the head of uh, DBI, Department of Building Inspection. That would have been nice to for them to have included in here. That's new information. Thanks. Uh, I'm Charles Marsteller, for the record, uh, representing FOE in part, um, not common cause. I uh, wanted to. Uh, suggest to you that the salary struck me as low for this position, um, given the expenses of the city, especially in regards to housing. That uh, housing is inflating so fast, it may well be that those numbers are not reasonable. Um, and I wonder if, in fact, this, and I'm not an expert on staff salaries within the department, but it may be that this salary level actually falls below some of the uh, employees of that de of the department so it'd be a little awkward to have the director earning less than staff it seems to me and that's a question that needs to be explored if we um, I don't see any reason why the salary should not be raised given the importance of the job um, and if that's tr if it's true that the consulting uh, the consultant or the uh, recruitment firm salary is a proportion of the uh, salary of the executive director. If you decide midstream to raise that salary, what impact would it have on your consultant's contract or your recruiter's uh, contract, if any? It seems to me that you would want to not get your court uh, horse before the cart. No, your cart before the horse. And uh, I think you get my pitch. Um, Otherwise, um, it does appear rather odd that there was only one uh, firm that stepped forward, and I'm wondering how common that is, and I would be thinking that you would want to have the answer to that question in case a member of the press asks. Uh, the HR people, in response to that inquiry, uh, said that uh, the other, some of the other firms had not uh, uh, had experience at the level that Alliance did with the city. That may be an answer to the question you're raising. Mr. Pilpel was asking why that wasn't noted on the back, but I see that they were really trying to refer, make references to other uh, cities and counties uh, and not refer to the people that they are in business with here in the city. It seemed pretty obvious that that's what they were doing. Okay. 
Good evening, Elena Schmidt. I was the foreperson of the civil grand jury 1314. I just have a quick comment. As I understand from a, the public meeting that you had regarding all this, you were going to talk about the recruitment, and then there would be another opportunity to talk about the job description itself and the, or the positions and requirement of the positions. I'll just note that on page six of what you received from the alliance, that they only give one week for that. And that's not very much time for public input and for you all to look at, at what you want. So I would just note that as a, if you're going to move with them to be sure you talk about that. Uh, I, I agree with you, but you notice that in their proposal, they talk about community meetings and meeting with the communities and meeting with the commissioners. And I had the same observation you did, that the one five days or something in June was an unrealistic okay. timetable. Thank you. I'm, I'm a little curious. It's been mentioned about the salary in the in the uh, HR proposal that went out to the recruiting firm, and I I didn't notice any salary being mentioned. It was in the old uh, in the the description of the job had a salary, but not in the proposal that went out to to the recruiting firms. And I had always been of the view that salary was probably something that's going to have to be negotiated depending upon the budget and depending upon the level of expertise of the individual who we may or may not be interviewing. Uh, but but I, didn't, I didn't see that there was any limitation in what went out to the recruiting firm uh, asking them to make a proposal that they had to think only in terms of a specific budget. Anyway, any other public comment? The, I would say that one of the comments that we got both at the session that uh, Commissioner Andrews and I had and at the other one that, that I was at was the fact the inadequacy of the job description in the recruiting, uh, uh, the, went out to the recruiting firms. Uh, and I had always viewed, and my response to that was, that this is sort of a two-step step process, that we need the recruiting firm to be the firm that's going to help us draft the profile. I don't think any of us sitting up here uh, either have the time or inclination to sit down and draft the profile, and HR doesn't, isn't in a position to do it, uh, or certainly doesn't have the, I don't think, the, the resources or background. And it was my intention, and it was, it's in the proposal from uh, uh, the, from Alliance, was that the first step that they have, were to be engaged in was to draft a job description uh, so that that I think the criticism of the proposal that went out uh, from the HR that it didn't adequately describe what we're looking for is probably correct but it's premature uh, and it's once we get the professionals involved who can help us draft the profile based upon materials we can give them. Uh, the public has suggested certain documents that we should give to them uh, to sort of educate them about the responsibilities of the uh, Ethics Commission. Uh, that once we do that, then we can get back a draft that the public and the commissioners are comfortable with that will then go out to potential candidates. That is, that's what I envisioned in the process. But I'm happy to have anybody comment on that or any other way in which we, we propose to go. But I think the first step uh, is we've got to engage some professionals to do it. And the fact that we got only one uh, response uh, means we don't have apples and apples to compare to and and 
our choices are whether we want to accept this uh, and say we'll go and try and negotiate a, a satisfactory agreement with them and go forward or say no, we, let's either start from ground zero again uh, and uh, send out a new wider series of requests for proposals from other recruiting firms that are not presently vetted by the city. What HR has told us is that, that if we do that, we are probably extending the search process, the search process for a recruiting firm, three months uh, before we could be in a position to make a determination because even if the commission felt a proposal that came in, if it was a firm that had not been vetted by the city, it has to go through the vetting process. And that is a, they say, a three-month process. You agree, Andrew? Uh, yeah, I mean, I actually recall their estimate of selecting through an open RFP process, a new RFP process for other recruiting firms to take at least four months. That, that was my recollection of their advice. Um, so obviously that would be something that needed to happen even before a job profile was drafted, reviewed by the commission, before that profile was to go out to whoever may be interested, before interviews and, and so on and so forth that could add a significant amount of time. Mr. Keene? <clears throat> yeah, I, I agree with uh, everything the chair has said. In fact, I'm pleased that uh, the chair recognized that uh, the observations of a number of people that the job description in itself is not really complete. And that is something that is by no means fatal or any great problem at this point, because we do need to have this additional information from the professionals. And that at some point, the job dis description will most, in my opinion, should be, and I hope will, be expanded to take into account some of the things that have been pointed out to us by the members of the public that should be added to the job description. So I'm just echoing what, what you say, Mr. Chair, that, that that's premature at this point to really deal with it directly, but it, it's something that certainly will be dealt with in terms of whether or not the description is accurate or should be fleshed out more. Mr. Uh, Hayden? Just as a preliminary um, step, uh, it would seem a simple thing to be in touch with all with similar organizations, other ethics commissions, other ethics, uh, you know, FPPC, whomever, and find out who they have used because that would certainly indicate that uh, it was a firm, a recruitment firm that has some experience in this particular professional area. And secondly, I don't think that the amount of time that it would take to vet uh, a, a recruitment firm that has not worked with the city um, is really that important. I mean, if it takes time to find the right director, then so be it. In the meantime, I think that we actually have, you know, competent staff, uh, a competent deputy director, and business, the things that need to be taken care of will be taken care of. I think the important thing is to make sure that we find someone in the future that can really fill, uh, fill the job and uh, take us to another level in terms of what this ethics commission should be doing. So I'm not concerned about the time. I, I, I see no reason to be in a big rush, which is not to say that we want it to take forever. But um, I think do the job well and have a positive result. That's what we want. Chairman Rennie, you, you mentioned that there was another uh, firm that did not get, get weren't, they weren't successful in meeting the deadline, but may be, uh, uh, may petition the commission to uh, extend, uh, extend that deadline, and if we were to, to honor that, that they would submit? Because I would believe that that would be our next step also, is to, one, decide whether we're going to do that, in which case we do have apples to apples and we would compare the two, and that could help us out rather than feeling like we're kind of 
backed into the corner of just having one proposal in front of us. And, and, and what, what's the benefit of that, and then are there any consequences to extending that? I certainly understand that in many ways when you put out an RFP, you know, one of the strongest, uh, you know, thumbs up or thumbs down in, in whether uh, you're going to be considered is if you get yours in on time. And uh, yes, there's an appeal process along the way, and I, sus I suspect that we could create an appeal process for them to submit why they couldn't meet that particular deadline. But I, it feels to me that we would want to at least address, address this particular one uh, because that's where we are in the process, reviewing a first round of, uh, of an RFP or an RFQ. Did, did they did they say that, that did the second search firm say that they would submit if they were given the chance to? I don't think uh, I know definitely one way or the other. I mean, I like Commissioner Andrews's idea. I mean, if 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 they can provide an explanation and the chair and vice chair can vet it, two proposals to me is better than one. Well, is one of the things that, of course, we could do is to tell HR that we view that we, we want to set a different cutoff date. In other words, we can extend the date, say, to January, June, whatever, and also instruct them along the lines that Commissioner Hayden said is for them to contact the various ethics commissions in the state of California and ask them what search firms, if any, they've used in their hiring of an executive director. I mean, we know the FPPC just appointed a new chair. Uh, now that, but that is a different process than ours. Uh, but the, the but there is no reason why HR couldn't find out, are there other firms that have done this who we might want to send the proposal to and see if we can get them interested? And not take any action on alliances. Seems to me we have sort of three choices tonight. One is we can either say, let's go with alliance and get the process moving. Two, let's set some further deadline and give some further instructions to HR to assist us, and then see whether or not that generates more responses. And then in the June meeting, make the decision, because I believe it has been my thought that it's the whole commission will make the decision as to which recruiting firm to hire. Uh, if you want to say no, you, unless you're going to delegate it to the chair and the vice chair, <coughs> fine. But right now, it had been my belief that it's the whole commission has a right to say, this is the firm we think you want to hire. So I throw those three choices out and tell me what you want done. Mr. Keen? I don't feel any need to make that decision myself as part of the commission. I'm, I'm perfectly confident, uh, confident in leaving it to the two of you to determine whether which of those two firms, if any, should go, f go forward. You've already done a lot of work on it. You've done a lot of research. You've gotten into it. And so uh, it, you come up with a decision and recommend that decision to us as far as I'm concerned, that's fine. I agree. Uh, I just want I wanted to ask one clarifying question. So you, the chair and the vice chair will have an opportunity to interview these firms. Is that right? You're not just going based on the paper proposal. And you'll have a chance to interview and negotiate and, and the like? It would be my hope that we would do that. OK. Because I agree with Commissioner Keene, provided that you have that opportunity. Yeah, right. yeah. Oh, yeah. I would, support, I would support moving forward with two and three concurrently, which is that we would uh, reach out to the firm that needed an extension, ask for them to uh, quickly submit a letter 
an appeal letter that, and an interest letter to say, yes, we're interested, here's why we weren't able to, we would review it, and, and then uh, decide to move forward with them, in which case they would prepare a proposal and, and then they would submit it. And the reason why I'm, I'm asking for uh, some letter of uh, uh, some appeal and process is the very first assignment, I, I don't want to hire an individual or hire an organization or an entity that has a problem with deadlines that may very well lead to a prob very other problems along the way. So um, uh, if your very first assignment you missed in some kind of way, I would need to know something very uh, uh, firm and, and, and reasonable and understandable as to why you did that. And once that is satisfied, and, and we are in agreement that we are satisfied with that answer, then we would move forward quickly with them submitting a proposal and then com compare and contrast those proposals, do a series of one-on-one of, um, -on -one interviews, uh, draft some questions that have been, uh, that we have, that we've learned and, on our concerns and, and our issues from the public, from our interested persons meetings, and, um, and then move forward from there. And, and, that, and then the third piece of that is, and concurrently give uh, DHR the assignment of reaching out to other um, ethics commissions or other, other municipalities and see um, who those search firm, firms were. Could, could I add a, just a couple of thoughts sure. on options two and three? Um, so on option two, um, my understanding, and unfortunately we don't have the benefit of DHR at the meeting here, but my understanding from our conversation this afternoon with them is that in terms of any extension, they would offer that extension to everyone but Alliance, that anyone else in the pool who has not yet submitted a proposal and, and is interested to do so can submit. So it wouldn't solely be to this one firm who at least initiate, you know, initially signaled some interest. Um, and in, in staying on option two for a second, um, in terms of the appeal letter, it may be useful for DHR to know whether or not the firm's decision not to include an appeal letter would immediately disqualify them from consideration. Um, maybe you don't need to make that decision here, but if you already are at a place where you really think you need an appeal letter or something in that vein to consider them seriously, it may be helpful. Um, on option three, in terms of reaching out to other ethics commissions, FPPC, other similar agencies. Um, again, I wish there were people from DHR here, but my understanding is that if we were to reach out of the current pre-qualified pool of six search firms, um, that would be an RFP that would just go out to any interested people. So it would be subject to the normal competitive processes that apply to contractors in the city. And I think there could be some restrictions in our ability to sort of <coughs> urge or tell specific firms to apply. Uh, I think that there may be issues about the competitive process if we're sort of giving certain firms a tap on the shoulder that they should be engaged. Uh, and, and, you know, sort of everyone can see the RFP at the same time. Everyone can make their own evaluation. That may be a better, better way to approach that. But again, that's sort of a DHR decision. If that makes sense. Does that, does that I'm, help? I, I'm, 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 I'm I'm more there with three than <coughs> two because okay. the, the fact is, is as, as, the, as the procurement process goes and an RFP goes, generally it, it, the, the world is now, uh, you know, on a particular date, May the 27th, it goes out, people are interested, and, and, and some folks may have, would go online, giving an example, go online and sure. say, you know, by, by tomorrow you have to go online and just show interest so that we know that you're interested. And for those who didn't meet that, it just pretty much would show that a lot, many people, many organizations wouldn't be interested in this, in this particular proposal. The fact is, is that someone has bothered to reach out enough to us to let us know that they wanted to submit a proposal, but they didn't. And this is why I feel like we need to treat them a little differently than the folks who just didn't apply because they may have they may have t had an internal meeting and said nope not for us it's just not something that we're interested in doing at this moment but they had enough internal conversation inside of that firm to say yes we're interested in doing it and we didn't do it or we and we didn't do it and i just don't know what that is and what i wouldn't want is that whatever that is to be uh, an institutional weakness that we would end up being on the short end of the stick oh. with stick up throughout the entire process which is, I'm sorry we missed that deadline. I'm sorry we didn't, we forgot to 
do X, Y, or Z? Sure. To be clear, I completely understand the motivation for wanting an explanation, uh, certainly at this very early stage. It's a little bit like showing up to a job interview late. Mm. <laughs> it doesn't Fair make enough. a good impression. Um, I, I think whichever way you want to go, if it's a, it's a condition of consideration, like they need to submit a letter to even be in the mix, I think it'd be helpful for DHR to do that and helpful for the other people in that pool to know that, just so they know going in. That was my only thought. Uh, Chair Rennie, I, I, I would say that um, w while I appreciate that we want an explanation, I don't know that it, we should make it disqualifying if they don't put in a letter. You could ask I, them about that in the interview, um, and uh, yeah, I'm fine with opening it back up to all five other candidates if they want to submit, and then you guys can vet as to why they didn't submit in the first place. So, in, in my, and I agree with you because in my, and I probably wasn't clear, I, I was believing that we were really only going to open up to that one other interested party. It's kind of like continuing to try to date someone who you're not interested in. If those three, four other organizations and entities aren't interested and they, then they're not interested. And that's okay. Um, so I was only moving forward under the belief that we were moving in with someone who was showing at least a little bit of interest in it. And then wanting to find out how they, why they were kind of sort of late to the job interview. But if we've decided to widen it for, for all of the pre-qualified, I agree that we should not have it as a disqualifier. But it still would be nice to know why they didn't submit on time. I, I would be a little uncomfortable. If we're going to extend the date, I think it should be extended for every firm to which a proposal went. Uh, and whether we extend it for a week, whatever it is, uh, I mean, we can, and we clearly, if, if a second firm that got the original proposal comes in, it's a fair question to ask them, why didn't you fi file it, why didn't you respond by the 26th, like we told you? And unless they've got a good answer, it may be important in saying whether there'll be deadlines in the future. Uh, but if we're going to do it for any of them that got the original proposal, I think we've got to extend the time out. So uh, is the quest next question then how far we w would extend our, our uh process, a proposal? That's the third proposal would be whether we're going to extend it by asking HR or you or me to communicate with all the ethics, one or the other of us communicate with the various ethics uh, commissions and ask them uh, to tell us what search firms they used and tell the city to send a proposal. I thought that Commissioner Andrews had suggested doing both concurrently, which I, I fully support. So you'd go ahead, extend the deadline for the six, two weeks, or whatever you think is reasonable. And then, yeah, perhaps the chair or the vice chair calls the FPPC or, or other ethics commissions and does some informal questioning about who they've used. And then we can decide whether we need to open this process up further and go on the further. <clears throat> further I will path. tell you, I did send an email to the new chair of the FPPC from which I've gotten no response <laughs> asking some of these questions. Uh, but I Maybe will follow Maybe you need follow to pay up. a visit. Uh, well, do you want to make that in the form of a motion? And uh, so, so I move that uh, uh, Put it on the first one. I, I, so I move that we extend the deadline for submission of proposals for recruiting firms uh, to the original identified um, city and county vetted firms, and concurrently, um, the the chair and the vice chair will have reach out and and have some informative uh, informational interviews. In, informal informational interviews with uh, other like bodies. 
Second. Can public, public comment? Can I just add? Uh, yeah. uh, well, you don't need to public, take public comment again, number one. Number two, um, in, in terms of extending the deadline, did you want to put a precise time frame there yet? Or, uh, or you could just delegate it to the committee. It's up to you guys. One, it's delicate. one week. It's a, you might want to leave it open because you might get information that you don't have now. Okay. I'm fine with the committee making that decision. Okay. Any public comment? I should have raised this issue earlier as Larry Bush. When you're talking about the budget that you're going to use, why doesn't the commission consider asking for a supplemental from the board? The budget for the Ethics Commission hasn't yet been presented by the mayor. It can still go through the Board of Supervisors. It's not unusual when you have a circumstance like this to say we want another thirty or forty thousand dollars in order to have a robust recruitment process to see that we have an excellent candidate given the fact that the last executive director served for 10 years. This is an important consideration. I don't see why you wouldn't say that that's a better use than trying to segregate out existing funds to pay $18,000 or $20,000. Uh, Charles Marsteller again. I wanted to say I think you can keep it simple. Your one week or approximately short extension. It certainly should be done generally and simply so you don't get yourself into a legal problem. And I will tell you, I've communicated by email with Bob Stern, who is in Europe. He was kind enough to reply. I asked about the various ethics bodies in the United States and which may have hired firms for this purpose. He went through the list with me on his email and indicated that essentially, to his knowledge, no one has. There was what? That no one has worked with a recruitment firm for the appointment of their major positions on their staff, to his knowledge. Uh, but he will be here in five days or so, so we'll be able to talk to him directly about that. But I would suggest you go ahead and do your outreach. That's a very good idea anyway on the hope that Mr. Uh, uh, Stern doesn't know everything. None of us do. David Pilpel again, speaking as an individual. Um, I agree with the one week delay. Um, I would suggest that you do put a specific deadline on it. If you make it a week from today or a week from tomorrow, you could put that back on the agenda for the June 5th special meeting to see what the response has been and if necessary to take uh, further action. I think this is sort of a becoming more of an iterative process um, and to the extent that you can uh, report back next Friday on where things are at. And it, again, if, if further uh, decisions are, are needed from the commission, that would be an, a, a good opportunity to do that. Thanks. Any other comment? All right, I'll call the question. All in favor? Aye. Aye. <clears throat> Opposed? Hearing none, it's carried 5-0. And the seven days, I guess, would put it to the 3rd of June. Is that right? I think we left it up to the, the, the I think we left it up to the committee to decide. In, in general, I feel, you know, that the more we can streamline with the committee making these kinds of decisions. The is there is there any reason why we not set it a date say either the third or the fourth and put an agenda item on the fifth uh, to see whether or not we want to revisit if let's assume we don't get a second proposal and we make our inquiries and we report back to you that we really don't have anything other than alliance but it may be at that point we're we're just going to go ahead well, well, I thought we authorized you and the vice chair to interview who, and any recruiting firm. So if you were to interview Alliance and you like Alliance and we don't have the proposals, then we would go there. 
Um, but w one reason I can think of why a week may not be enough is if you talk to DHR and they say, there's no way you're getting another proposal if you only extend it a week. I don't know what they'll say, but uh, that's why I think it's better for you two to think about it, talk to them, and, and decide what's, what's best. And then, you, you know, we can certainly ask questions about it, but we don't have to talk about it as a formal agenda item on every meeting to make every decision about where we are in the process of getting a recruiting firm. I thought that was the point of having the well, I, I, I guess I want to be, well, I want to be clear. Are, are, you, are you saying that you want Commissioner Andrews and myself to just go forward with the process, select the recruiter, and just report back to you and tell you this is what we've done? but not getting any approval from any of you. I mean, that's fine if that's what you want. be fine with me. That's fine with me. I mean, subject to, of course, you know, the budget issue we may have right. to talk about, but. All right. That's what I thought that we had. Yeah. We have our marching orders. <laughs> and you, you, sh you, I don't know if, I didn't understand it, but I now understand it, that whenever Commissioner Andrews and I meet in this recruiting process, it's a meeting of the commission requiring an agenda and requiring notice uh, to the public. Is that correct? That is correct. Um, so just in terms of uh, just clarifying the action taken by the commission tonight, are you rescinding the prior motion? No. Okay, so is there an additional motion that the special committee consisting of the chair and vice chair are delegated entirely with the responsibility of selecting a search firm on now, behalf of the commission? My understanding of what the motion was. To me, I mean, it seems like a slightly different motion to me, and maybe for the sake of transparency, that would be helpful. It seems like there was a lot of consent to that concept. So maybe to be safe, we should make another motion. That may be helpful. I'll move to delegate to the chair and vice chair the uh, decision on choosing the search firm. Second. Any discussion? Any public comment? And I'll call the question. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion is carried. I guess you and I can vote on it. 5-0. Yeah, <laughs> oh. All right. Let's move to item five which is discussion and possible action on Commissioner Keene's, quote, report on recommendations for both a rewrite of the language of Proposition J and for a restoration of the Commission's oversight of expenditure lobbying and ballot measure for upcoming elections. And attachment, Commissioner Keene's report and his proposed draft to lobbying ordinance and I think the most recent draft of your proposal is what's circulated, was it not, with our minutes, with our agenda? Okay. So, Commissioner Keene, i uh, ask yeah. you to report. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, in my report itself, it pretty much sets out the history of what we've done since the last meeting when you appointed me as an ad hoc committee of one. Relating to two matters, whether or not Prop J should be rewritten in some different respects and proposed for the ballot this year, and secondly, whether or not we should uh, put together a, uh, a regulation of expenditure lobbyists and also submit that to the ballot this year. As is said in my report, after discussions with the chair, we, the chair and I both came to agree that uh, the effort was just too big to do all of this this year. We couldn't do that since the, uh, to have it on the November ballot. So we, in regard to anything relating to Prop J, that's put off to another day. Hopefully we'll, we'll go ahead and undertake that in the late summer and the autumn for whatever rewrite we think is appropriate, if any, to, and to submit in a ballot measure for 2016. The expenditure lobbying regulation, though, is a rather simple matter, and as is put forth in the language. And what that does is it just 
creates a category of expenditure lobbyists which had existed really before the uh, commission had shrunken everything down into one definition of lobbyists which had a triggering effect where there was at least one contact between the lobbyist and the individual being lobbied. What this does is what, what many people, the civil grand jury, friends of ethics, and also this commission back in, 19, in, in 2013 had recognized as that something had been lost there, that it was just too narrow. And one could be a lobbyist, uh, a very powerful lobbyist, by ex expenditures in favor of things on behalf of someone who was in power without having any contact with that person and doing it for the purpose of influencing that individual in legislation and other types of matters. So uh, what this does is this creates a category of an expenditure lobbyist where the single contact is not necessary as a triggering uh, aspect of whether or not someone is in that category of an expenditure lobbyist. If someone engages in actual expenditures that can be identified for the purpose of influencing someone in regard to legislation or other type of civil, uh, civic action, someone in power, and someone is doing that, that person has to register as a lobbyist and file reports. Uh, in regard to disclosure of who is a lobbyist and who is not a lobbyist, this is one of the areas, happily, that the Supreme Court has left alone, for the most part, in terms of Citizens United and all of the other things which, which drew in the ability of government to regulate expenditures and saying, no, you can't make those expenditures. This doesn't do that. This goes with the question only of disclosure, which the Supreme Court has said, that's fine in all respects. If someone is indeed acting as a lobbyist for the purpose of influencing people in power, then in the interest of transparency, in the interest of good government, then the citizens within the jurisdiction should know that that person is doing it. That doesn't, we're not, not saying, oh, you can't do that, you can't spend it, you can do whatever you want. But the fact that you're doing it should be known. And, and that is all that this measure would do in terms of creating an expen uh, a, a, a category of expenditure and lo lobbyists. So it's something that, uh, that has, has been drafted I've had the uh, good fortune of having people who've looked at this over in the past, like Oliver Luby and Friends of Ethics and the members of the Civil Grand Jury, help me in the drafting of uh, the particular lobbyist, uh, th that particular lobbyist provision and superimposed it upon the existing legislation which relates to lobbyists. Mr. Maynardi has provided good input in regard to things that he sees as suggestions for the wording. And his input has caused changes in regard to how the actual wording of the, lob of the, of the measure should be. I would uh, request that the commission tonight authorize us to continue with this dialogue with the staff over the course of the next month uh, and further uh, 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 craft the language that we want for an expenditure lobbyist. And then at the next meeting, have before us the actual, what we, what we all see, we're never all gonna agree on everything, anything, what is the preferred language that we come to for an expenditure lobbyist, at which point, the commission then can, will have a, had the opportunity to examine it probably for several weeks. You've got, the commission has just had a massive material thrown at it in the last few days, and I, it, I know it's hard to, to, to digest. 
But by that time, I think the commissions, the members of the commissions, their thoughts will have gelled in regard to this. And we can look at it and come up with a yay and or nay as to whether or not we want to put this on the 2015 ballot. So that's where we are with this. Discussion? I, I have one question. If we were to proceed as Commissioner Keene suggests, isn't there a requirement for us to hold some kind of a hearing of, to make a finding as to the need for this, uh, this uh, uh, legislation? Um, uh, there's no uh, specific legal requirement that the commission needs to have a hearing to justify the need for this proposal or this set of amendments. Uh, certainly it would be in keeping with the commission's past practice on a whole range of policy matters to examine the need for any regulation prior to proposing language um, that would address that issue. But there's no specific legal requirement. Certainly we're going to at least have a discussion today. It sounds like at least one more discussion. Sounds like at the end of June. Um, so there will at least be two two times in which the commission has considered the matter. Commissioner. Thank you, Chair Rennie. Uh, first of all, my thanks to Commissioner Keene for, for going above and beyond as a commissioner and actually working to draft uh, legislation. Um, and I agree with the idea that we need to do something about expenditure lobbyists. I, I think that's important. I think we need to we need further regulation on it uh, for the reasons that Commissioner Keene identifies. I, I do have a couple concerns that I wanted to, to raise. Um, regarding the specific language that's been proposed, I do think it's, it's too broad, and, and I know that Commissioner Keene is going to go back and, and work with the staff and others on it. Um, but, I, but I'm very concerned that the definition of expenditure lobbyist is too broad and too difficult to enforce. Uh, I, I, I really think we should hone it more narrowly um, and, and give more thought into how this fits into the rest of the, the regs. Um, I'm also, I also have questions about what it means to register and how that process would work after one is no longer considered an expenditure lobbyist. For example, if they spend 5000 in three months, they don't spend again for a year. Are they, are they still a lobbyist, and do they have to then it, – it appears to me that, that it's suggesting they then have to um, register as, a, as an expenditure lobbyist before they spend another dime on, uh, on additional uh, efforts to influence local legislative or administrative action. So th that's just sort of at a high level some of my concerns. Um, my second main concern is a process concern. Um, Typically, and I'm glad that the staff has been involved in this, but, but typically the staff is responsible for doing the drafting. They are, uh, you know, they're, they're the ones who are doing the analysis. We get a memo describing why each change was made, uh, what the potential pitfalls are, uh, where it came from, what, how it compares to, to previous language. So uh, I would suggest that we, we have um, even more involvement from the staff if we can on it. Uh, I know that we have lots of other things on the, on the list to do, so I, I'm not sure exactly how that will, will work as a timing point, but I, I, I would, you know, especially if we're going to go to the ballot, we need to make sure this is right because we can't easily amend it. Um, so I would really want staff, the regulated community, the public, I mean, I would lot, want a lot of input on whether we're getting this right. Further to that point, I wonder whether we shouldn't first try to run this through the board. Um, if we go through the board, then, you know, it can be more easily amended, um, that it can get further vetted there. If, if the board guts it or if the board does something we don't like, we always have the trump card to go to the, go to the voters. Um, but, uh, you know, the board may be, that may provide us with more ability to see what this looks like in a couple years and, and, and amend it further uh, as needed. The last thing I'll say about the, the proposed timing is, unfortunately, and this obviously uh, has, uh, is, is not in any way dispositive, but, but I will not be able to attend the June 22nd meetings. I'll be in trial in Washington, D.C., and um, 
So if, if possible, I would ask that it could be considered at a, at a different time, but I totally understand that uh, the commission will, will do whatever is most appropriate and beneficial. Thank you. Any other commissioner? Let me ask you, Commissioner Keene, give me an illustration of an expenditure lobbyist. Just so I am clear what what it is that we're what we're trying to get at. You want supervisor X to favor a particular position for you. You then go ahead and uh, have a conference in the Four Seasons Hotel in Nice, France, that you sponsor. And, you, and Supervisor X is someone, and there are a number of individuals who are going to speak on various types of topics. Supervisor X is someone who is invited. You have had no contact with Supervisor X. But Supervisor X, just by coincidence, is spending two weeks in the south of France in beautiful weather, enjoying the amenities of the Four Seasons, uh, and uh, then comes back. You've had no dealings whatsoever with Supervisor X. You haven't asked them to do anything. But you're, it can be, you're doing it clearly to influence his legislation. That's an expenditure lobbyist. I've used an extreme. But you can see within those extremes, you might be able to pick out certain things that you've seen have happened in San Francisco with various individuals in power over the years. So that if somebody, although this may already have to be disclosed, but if somebody were to finance a rally, purportedly a groundswell of the public, on some piece of legislation that some entity or some individual in the city was interested in, and he or she financed putting that group together, he or she would be an expenditure lobbyist if, if it was over 5000 Yeah, if they were doing it for the purpose of influencing the ac actions of the city official. They could do it. That's fine. They can do it. They want to spend the money, then fine. But the public should know about it. You want to state your motion as to how what you want the sure. commission to uh, I, I, I'd tonight? Yes, uh, I'd like the commission to approve the process going forward that uh, we continue the drafting of the measure uh, with myself, the staff, other interested members of the public, and that uh, at our next meeting we then would come back to the commission with language, with a proposed ballot initiative for the commission to vote yay or nay on. I would just ask for the commission to approve that process. Second. Second. Seconded. Uh, public comment? Hello, Larry Bush from Friends of Ethics. Uh, you asked for examples of what is a expenditure lobbying. And as it happens, one of the things that's going on right now is, as, as you meet is the Democratic Party Central Committee is meeting. And on the agenda there is uh, the question of the mission moratorium. And I have here articles that have appeared recently in the paper on examples of expenditure lobbying. This is in October of 2014. You have Airbnb having hired... Uh, a lobbyist uh, to, quote, to recruit people who rent out their homes to lobby supervisors to support a bill friendly to the company. None of that had to be reported because they were not contacting the supervisor. They were paying for other people 
to go do it. So I've got a copy of that for each of you. Most so you, I just want to understand your example. You're saying they paid, they hired lobbyists who then contacted. Yes, and but. But wouldn't uh, the wouldn't the lobbyists have the to lobbyist, disclose? The lobbyists would only have to be disclosed if they were contacting an official. But if they're reaching out, for example, I'll use another one: a group called Grow SF that has just uh, emerged, along with a, a second group called SF Barf, and I'm. I'm not attributing any value to that. It's called the Bay Area Renters Federation. And uh, what they do is they, they are helping people prepare to give public comment at the upcoming Democratic Central Committee meeting on Wednesday and beyond. And so they're having a tutorial for people at a cafe on how to do public comment at these things. This is what is happening in part because of the growth of the sharing community or the sharing industry, which has a lot of people who are individuals, and then they come up. You've heard of home sharers as one of the groups that shows up. Um, there's other groups that, that also show up. Uh, and they are not disclosing what it is that they're being paid and who's paying them. In fact, in the Business Times, they write about the fact that they do not have to disclose who's paying them, and they do not have to disclose how much is being spent. So those are articles for you folks. And just to recap a little bit of the history that we've talked about, in 2010, this was a provision in San Francisco's lobbyist law. And when the commission met at that time, staff suggested that the lobbyist law could be streamlined. And it was streamlined by eliminating categories of reporting to the public. They, were at, they asked their uh, deputy city attorney at that meeting, do these changes have to further the purposes of the act? And the deputy city attorney's statement in the minutes is that no, it does not. There is no requirement when it comes to lobbying laws that changes further the purposes of the act. The purpose that the commission had was simply to simplify the process, but it had nothing to do with whether or not you're providing the public with the information that's needed. I know Your my time, time is up. up. I'll have a PS if I could. Good, e good evening, commissioners. I'm Paul Melbestad. I served on this commission for eight years from 1995 to 2003. And it was during that period that for the first time the Ethics Commission put a ballot measure on the ballot. And what I would like to address is why the public really depends on the Ethics Commission to take the leadership and why the Ethics Commission should put this measure on the ballot and rather than first uh, going to the Board of Supervisors. Uh, I'm the commissioner who made the motion uh, to put the measure on the ballot. It was Proposition O that would provide for public financing of uh, supervisors elections and also for the first time regulate expend, uh, contributions to independent expenditure committees. And it was Judge Isabella Horton Grant, uh, who was the president of the commission at the time, who urged me to make the motion. And the reasons she did is initially she had also thought, oh, out of respect for the supervisors, we should go to the supervisors and present this proposal and get their input. And uh, we unanimously voted to let uh, Judge Grant go over and make a presentation to the board. And to our great surprise, she was roundly rebuked by virtually all of the supervisors. Uh, it, I found it actually quite shocking. As those of you who are lawyers know that Judge Grant was by no means a wild-eyed uh, activist type. She was a very distinguished uh, uh, mild-mannered person and but the reaction of the supervisors was how dare these non-elected commissioners suggest that we could be subject to corruption by money and really they gave no positive input at all and the reason I you know realized was because all of the supervisors across all across the ideological spectrum have interest groups and constituencies that like to spend money on lobbying but don't want to report it and uh, that's, that's, this is precisely the type of issue that the public needs to rely on the Ethics Commission to take the lead on because uh, you commissioners are not uh, subject to getting or not depending on campaign contributions from these interest groups. 
And uh, I, I'm also the uh, commissioner that then worked with City Attorney uh, Rennie's office on the specific language uh, of the ballot measure, and it was uh, resoundingly passed by the voters. So uh, I would urge you to move ahead as quickly as possible uh, to put this measure on the ballot, uh, and uh, thank you for, for all your service on this commission. I know what a thankless task it is. Hello, my name is Vivian Imperiali. I strongly support moving forward with a ballot measure to require disclosure of expenditure lobbying. It is apparent that many citizens are unaware that powerful forces are behind what may seem to be grassroots lobbying. We need to know what financial and political influences are at play behind the actions of what may seem to be well-intentioned groups acting on their own behalf when they are in fact not. Any resistance to full disclosure is suspect in itself. Let's change the picture as the public has a right to know the real players and the amount of their financial investment. Thank you for your work on this. Any other? Uh, Charlie Marsteller again. Um, I wanted to report what I saw in the Sacramento Bee uh, not more than three weeks ago. They did a, uh, a first page or front page report on the current quarter of lobbying activity in Sacramento. And the numbers were very large, but that wasn't really what caught my eye. It was this large photograph of a group of purported health care reform advocates. And the picture was illustrating essentially exactly what we're talking about, a grassroots effort to that's sponsored by a lobbying organization for the purposes of influence administrative and legislative action by their elected officials under the guise that this was a grassroots surgency that that uh, that they wanted the elected officials to know about the truth was that this was expenditure lobbying and uh, i'll be happy to send mr st croix this picture i the problem is I thought about blowing it up and bringing it in, but I was advised by my computer people that the pixelations would distort the image as it, it got larger. So I should have sent it to you by email, but I'll go ahead and do that now. Uh, good evening, Commissioners. Anita Mayo, Pillsbury Winthrop Shop, Pittman. I would like to clarify the information in the history section of the report to the proposed legislation. It appears from this information that because San Francisco's lobbying law does not regulate expenditure lobbyists, the city is not capturing hundreds of thousands of dollars of lobbying activities. That simply is not the case. An expenditure lobbyist in the prior version of San Francisco's lobbying law and in all of the jurisdictions listed in the report, Sacramento, San Jose, San Diego, Los Angeles, and the state of California, is defined generally as an individual or entity that spends $5,000 or more in a calendar quarter or calendar year on public relations type activities to urge the public to lobby public officials using ads, mailers, et cetera. Expenditure lobbyists are commonly referred to as grassroots lobbyists. The $5,000 threshold typically excludes compensation paid to contract and employee lobbyists and dues payments made to organizations. Expenditure lobbyists in all of the jurisdictions noted in the report are not required to register. In addition, these expenditure lobbyists typically file reports only when the $5,000 threshold has been reached for a particular quarter. The reports must include typically the matters uh, the expenditure lobby is sought to influence. Some jurisdictions, such as Sacramento and San Jose, don't even require disclosure of any payments made to influence lobbying. 
Others, such as Los Angeles, San Diego, and the state, do require disclosures of payments. The definition of expenditure lobbyists in the proposed legislation is not the typical definition. It appears to add the element of some sort of payment uh, or rewards or gifts to a person for lobbying. This is typically excluded from the definition in most jurisdictions. Such a definition as proposed will create confusion. The proposed legislation also imposes a registration requirement on expenditure lobbyists and regular monthly reporting regardless of the activity which also deviates from all of the cited jurisdictions. Finally, it is my understanding that when the lobbying law was amended in 2010 and the expenditure lobbies category was deleted from the law, it was done because so very few individuals or entities qualified as expenditure lobbies in San Francisco. Most lobbying in the city is accomplished through the payment of compensate, compensation to individuals to lobby city officials directly, and that is exactly what the current law captures. As a consequence, the proposed legislation is not needed and will create unnecessary confusion in the regulated community. However, if you do decide to proceed with including the category of expenditure lobbies in the lobbying law, I urge you to adopt the versions that similar to the provisions in the lobbying laws of either Sacramento, San Jose, San Diego, Los Angeles, or the state of California. Thank you. Good evening, I'm Armin Kumeli. I'm an attorney with Nielsen Merksimer. Our firm represents a number of registrants and potential lobby registrants with the city and county. And we have two primary concerns with the proposed uh, expenditure lobbying amendment. First, we're concerned with the recommendation that these changes be implemented through the ballot measure process as opposed to the legislative process. Using a ballot measure to enact this proposal would effectively tie the hands of the commission and prevent you from enacting any clarifying amendments or even uh, cleaning up the language of the statute. As we've all experienced, even though a law may be enacted for a distinct purpose, its interpretation can be construed uh, outside of the original intent of the authors. Thus, amendments are necessary to subvert any loopholes or any unforeseen circumstances created by the law. Furthermore, once the laws are in effect, the practical application would uh, require, likely require some sort of clarifying amendments to ensure that the statutes are actually functioning as intended. If enacted by ballot measure, any amendment would need to go through that same ballot measure process again, thus obstructing the Commission's ability to efficiently remedy any unintended circumstances of the law. Further, it would take another election cycle to ensure that the public is adequately informed of the lobbying activities of the city. Second, we respectfully request that the Commission open this proposal to additional comments and IP meetings to determine whether there's a more effective and efficient way to achieve the proposal. The current proposal uh, could create redundancies in the disclosure process where, for example, a single organization could be required to file even more reports disclosing much of the same activity. This would be confusing to the public as they would have to navigate through multiple layers of redundant reporting. Additional IP uh, and uh, comment periods would provide the Commission with the opportunity to consider an alternative, uh, alternative options for capturing this information without creating a complex and confusing reporting scheme. For example, if the Commission were to adopt a reporting system similar to the state, whereby a, um, the information that's going to be captured under the expenditure lobbying proposal could be captured all for the same organization under one single report. It would be much easier for the public to, um, to interpret this lobbying information if it appears in one report. For these reasons, we respectfully request that this commission uh, proceed through the legislative process uh, for the proposal and not the ballot measure process, and as well provide additional opportunities for comment and review of the legislation. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, uh, Robert Van Ravensway, former civil grand jury member. I think it would be great if you guys put something on the ballot. It's been a long time, a, re a really long time. If there's a concern about the language being properly drafted, uh, I, I think at some point you need to meet with the 
drafting people in the city attorney's office who do the drafting for the uh, Board of Supervisors. Um, and I think they're, you're in the shop that they're in. Uh, so I think that, that would be an important step for you to take. Um, and if there's concern about placing something on the ballot and it not being amendable in the future, this is one chapter of the Governmental Conduct Code that does not have the provisions that you see in the campaign finance section and the conflict of interest section that provide that it can be amended to further the purposes of the chapter by, I think, uh, four votes of the Ethics Commission and two-thirds vote of the Board of Supervisors. And I think it would be, this would be an excellent opportunity to add this to the lobbying ordinance as well. And then you can put it on the ballot and corrective measures can be taken in the future. But it would go through a similar process that you see with co campaign finance and uh, with the conflict of interest ordinance. And I, and I think the language is basically standard between those, those two sections. So I think it's something you can easily lift and drop in, into this chapter. So uh, that would be my suggestion. Thank you. Thank you. David Pilpel again, speaking as an individual. I certainly respect the strongly held views of those who are pushing this concept. I believe I remember in 2009, 2010, when this was changed. Um, I believe the reason, the primary reason, was that the staff did want to simplify and um, make most of the provisions similar to other jurisdictions in, in the state. Um, and I recall that there were issues with the definition of an expenditure lobbyist and how to actually track that there were expenditures made and that this could be implemented, regulated, enforced. Um, so I feel very strongly that the language crafted here needs some more work to the extent that it may go forward, should actually have language that's workable. Um, I don't have a strongly held view as to whether this is a huge problem that needs to be addressed through regulation. I guess it's always been my belief that people with money or financial interests, um, be they developers, people with a policy interest, um, others, will spend money to make their views known either directly through contacts or indirectly through grassroots work or advertising or some other means. So it doesn't surprise me that Airbnb or others spend money to try to get their way in this building. Um, I guess I'm just a guy that doesn't have money and just goes to meetings and makes public comment and I feel like that can work as well. Sometimes I win, sometimes not. But hey, I don't have a big corporation behind me, so there's that. Um, I do agree with the couple of comments that you just um, heard about including provisions in here to allow the board by two-thirds vote and the commission by two-thirds vote with findings and with a 30-day period uh, for public review to make uh, clarifying or furthering amendments. That's consistent with other uh, provisions in the law but is not in the lobbyist ordinance and I think uh, would be in order and helpful here. Thank you. Good evening, commissioners. My name is Joan Wood. I live in North Beach. I've been there 50, 50 years. I've never appeared before your commission before. I'm usually busy arguing before the Library Commission or MTA or Rec and Park. And it's usually unsuccessful, but you're the Ethics Commission. After all, that implies a much better chance of being heard. Um, I'm not... 100% clear about what's happening here, but I do see that in 2009, a previous a group of ethics commissioners gave themselves oversight over lobbyists, and they defined what a lobbyist was. And s along the way, that oversight seems to have become eroded. I'm not too clear why, but I do see that the definition currently of a lobbyist uh, is that the person that's giving money or trying to influence decisions has to have one physical contact with a 
city employee. I think that's kind of ridiculous on the face of it. Uh, what I gather is that Mr. Keene was authorized uh, with help to prepare a report about what uh, should be done to maybe broaden the definition of a lobbyist. That can't be a bad thing, can it? It just can't be. And all I heard him ask was that he be given a month to revise the report, at which time you could look at it again. And I hope for the sake of people who have been trusting you that you will agree to that. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> <coughs> All right, I would call the question. Okay. I apologize. I mean, if I could just um, raise a couple of very brief process sure. points. Um, the first is just to follow up on Mr. Van Ravensway's comments. Um, certainly, I personally in my office are, are happy to participate in this effort. Um, as with pretty much all ballot measures that would be submitted to the voters, our office does usually draft the final form of the ordinance. And certainly, I'm happy to coordinate with Commissioner Keene, any other interested parties and staff in that drafting process. Uh, secondly, and this is just because Commissioner Herr made a brief mention of his availability in June, I just want to remind the Commission that the submission of something to the ballot requires a four-fifths vote. So if people are looking to June as a potential date to submit this, without Commissioner Herr her, her here, um, obviously we would need a unanimous vote every, over everyone else. And if there's going to be someone else who can't make the June meeting, that should probably be taken into consideration as well. <clears throat> Mr. Keene. Yeah, uh, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chair. Just to follow up on a couple of things, I would like to indicate for the record that in regard to the drafts and the materials that Mr. I've been sending to Mr. Minority, I've also been sending them to Mr. Chen, and I've had s some feedback from Mr. Chen that he has been in touch with Mr. Minority, and he is, in his, in his words, he's in the loop on what's going on. So the process of the city attorney's office being involved in this, which has just been over the course of the last couple of weeks, has indeed been part of the, the, the overall process. Uh, and uh, they're aware of it. They're aware of the differences in <coughs> languages. They've been had, are invited along with Mr. Minority to to go ahead and, and, and make their own submissions as to any kind of changes. Uh, and certainly that would be the process that we would continue over the course of the next month. The city attorney's office is part of the, part of the package here. Um, <clears throat> I'd just like to add one other thing <clears throat> in regard to one of the things that Commissioner Hur said with all respect, I just want to, and I'm glad that Mr. Melbostat is here. And that is the whole idea, well, we ought to just let the board do this. Uh, I don't think so. Uh, we heard Mr. Melbostat's history of a very un un unfortunate incident, which I think is going to be char is characteristic of the way the board of supervisors, as a legislative body, with their own axes to grind, with their own constituency, <coughs> with their own, and I say this not as a pejorative, their own payoffs, whatever those may be, from interest groups or other, other things, they are not the group that can look at this neutrally. It's asking the fox to guard the chicken coop. That's, and, and, and one of the reasons, one of the main reasons, as Mr. Melbostad indicated, and has been indicated here that this commission is unique is that it, we have this independent power to put things on the ballot where we know that if we go ahead and say, all right, well, we'll submit it to the Board of Supervisors, they're going to grind it up like hamburger or they're going to put it in the wastebasket or they're going to sit on it and it's not going to happen. It's just not going to happen. And we all know that. So I, I think that should be taken off the table right away, the whole idea. Well, it's, this is for the board to do. The board isn't going to do it. Uh, and we have an obligation to do this. We've heard from the citizens of San Francisco. We've heard from lots of people. We can see that something was lost when this change was made by this commission. We have an obligation as a commission in the interest of transparency, in the interest of ethics, which is what we're supposed to be all about, to go ahead and do this, and I hope we do. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Commissioner Herr. Uh, Mr. Chair, I have a couple follow-up questions to the points that Mr. Shen raised, and I'd also like to respond to Commissioner Keene. Uh, so can you describe to us the difference in the amendment process if we were to put in the uh, the proposal that Mr. Ravensway offered, how would it differ in terms of amending uh, this legislation if it had been if it was approved by the voters versus if it was entered into by the Board of Supervisors? Yeah, so the purpose of the provision that Mr. Van Ravensway uh, mentioned was that both the campaign finance reform ordinance and the governmental ethics ordinance are were substantially enacted by the voters. Now, as many of the commissioners are aware, anything that's been enacted by the voters can't be amended by the Board of Supervisors. It needs to go back to the voters for their approval and consideration. Now, the campaign finance reform ordinance and the governmental ethics ordinance have the clause, remember Mr. Van Ravens we mentioned, to allow for later legislative fixes, so long as those changes fulfill or carry out the purposes of those provisions. So in a, in a way, it allows you not to not have to go back to the voters if some future amendments need to be considered, so long as, again, they're consistent uh, with the purpose and spirit of, of those original ordinances. Um, so it, al it allows you to ameliorate some of the concerns about being able to adjust, tweak, make slight fixes to something that was approved by the voters in a way that... And, and I would just say from personal experience, it's always... You always try to strive for perfect ordinance, but it's, it's a very difficult thing to get to. So having that option is always a, a good thing, in my opinion. I agree. Uh, so if, if, alternatively, we propose it to the board and they enact it, how, how, is the amendment process, how does the amendment process differ? Yeah, so if you go through the normal legislative process, um, that sort of provision is not as, I guess, necessary. Uh, because any board enacted ordinance could simply be amended by the normal legislative process. Um, so six votes to the board, three votes here, as opposed to the supermajority requirements present in that clause, two-thirds of the board, four-fifths of the commission. So it's not, you could, certainly any ordinance, well, actually, I'd take that back. It, it, it yeah, it wouldn't be as necessary um, for any board enacted ordinance to include that provision. It's really designed and, and intended to be used in connection with voter-approved measures. So, so the difference then in terms of affecting changes to legislation is a supermajority is needed. It's got to be consistent with the purposes of the legislation if we go to the ballot. If we go to the board, it's majority, and any change can be made as long as majority approves. Is that Yeah, is that exactly. Right? So you don't really need that clause in certain an ordinance that's been enacted through the normal legislative process, such as the lobbyist ordinance. It looks like Mr. Uh, Dan Ravensley wants to say something. I don't know if... If I may. Um, it's not my decision. supervisors amended the lobbyist ordinance last year. It did not come to the Ethics Commission in any way, shape, or form. I, I think... Perhaps there were some comments made by the Ethics Commission. You know, what I, what I talk about is consistent with uh, state law, uh, you know, the Fair Political Practices Act, which was approved by the voters, and, and the sections of uh, city ordinances that were appro approved by the voters. If you make this sort of change in the lobbyist law, big sections of the lobbyist law will have been approved by the voters at that point. And, uh, you know, this sort of process would allow, the voters would approve this process to allow amendment in the future by the supermajority kind of uh, process. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Shen. Sure. Uh, and the only, the only other thing I would say is um, I, I, I have no opposition to uh, Mr. Keene's proposal, uh, other than the fact that it comes at a time when I won't be here, so that's uh, will 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 be the basis of my vote. But I but I understand. I, I'll call the question. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? No. Carried four to one. Just uh, just by way of clarification, could I just ask what ultimately will be expected of staff during this time for this project? Just 
for planning purposes. As I understand it, <clears throat> that uh, a memo or Commissioner Keene uh, will be working with the staff and with the city attorney's office to draft a final version uh, that will he will ask the commission at the June meeting to say yes, let's go forward with it, uh, or not go forward with it, or hold it off, but whatever it is. And uh, that's that's my understanding. So so no memo, basically. That's right. Oh. No memo. Just exclusively feedback. I'm sorry. Exclusively I, feedback, as opposed to. Uh, Preparing a memo, drafting language. Memos are fine. Oh, okay. well, no, I, I, it's just by way of clarification for our work plan. That's no, really, but I mean, is, as I understand it, what what will come back to us is not a memo, right? But a drafted proposed piece of legislation. That's correct. Yeah. Right. That Commissioner Keene will ask us to either yay or nay. Right, and as what I guess what I was just wanted clarification in terms of what our workload would be is would as Commissioner Herr had stated is often there's a there's a memo, there's something that accompanies that I'm just for planning purpose just want to understand is it the commission just said we'll have feedback from staff on this. It's just an unusual process how I'm trying to figure out for planning purposes, what we will be saying. Mr. Chair, yeah, I, I think at the time when we have the working document, at that point, whoever wants to weigh in on anything relating to the working document, we should all, those people, everybody should have at it. You should have at it. City attorney should have at it. Okay. Yeah. Members oh, of the public fine. should have at it. And then we'll, we'll, we'll make a decision. Yeah, that's great. So, so <laughs> yes to a memo or... Who, t who takes the lead on Who's taking the lead on this? I am. On drafting the map. So you're taking the lead on it, but it sounded to me that, that Commissioner Her, maybe I misheard, it sounded like the staff more took the lead in the past. And I was wondering if I, heard, if I was hearing between the lines, does it, does it help for the staff in a situation like this to continue to take the lead? So that it doesn't look, so that there isn't the appearance of anything else other than the process that we ultimately could easily use and get to the same outcome. Well, but, uh, Mr. Chair, if I may. Yes, Commissioner Keene. This is something that the commission, or at least, well, the commission has initiated. The chair appointed an ad hoc committee, me, to go ahead and report on these things and to make recommendations. I've done that. Um, and now I'm asking that the process go forward in regard to the work of that ad hoc committee, me, with the staff, and we'll have some sort of outcome as a result of it. So I'm not quite sure w w what you're saying when you say, well, should the staff just take over, or is that, I, I, don't, I don't know where you come from. Well, Commissioner Herr, can you recount what you think? Sure. My so, yeah. My understanding is that typically the staff will, will do the drafting, they will take input from the public, they will uh, write a memo that explains sort of why we're doing this, what, you know, the, the particular changes, the pitfalls, uh, and, and then we'll make a vote on it. Um, it, it this is an unusual process. Uh, again, I, I appreciate that, you know, Commissioner Keene has been able to devote so much time to it, um, but I... I do think the staff needs a big role in it, and, and I think, you know, a memo from them and, and heavy involvement is, is warranted in my, in my view. Now, I know the staff has a lot of other things going on timing-wise, so that's potentially a problem, but I would be, I would be loath to go forward without staff feeling that they had fully vetted this. If I could say that just the, the, the reason the for my question. the chair, I'd just like to point out that the commission asked the staff to draft this in July of 2013, two years ago. They've had two years to draft something and have not returned it back to the commission. So the fact that this is unusual has to do with the fact that the staff did not perform what it was assigned to do by the commission. 
That's why you've got it here. We're, we're well, passing me. public comment. Yeah. Let me say <clears throat> that uh, as I envision what would happen or what should happen between now and June is that the draft and whatever revisions be Commissioner Keene working with the staff may want to make based upon the comments that have been received both from uh, Mr. Minardi and others, but it should be submitted to the city attorney's office to draft a final document. Uh, to say and present it to the commission saying this is the final draft that the city attorney's office is prepared to sign off on to go on the ballot. And that's, that's, uh, and I, in that regard, I particularly urge the city attorney's office to focus on enforcement. Uh, provisions in that statute and if there are problems to I would assume that the city attorney will present those problems to us and we'll have to decide what revisions to make if any based on those but what I would what I would envision and I think it's what Commissioner Keene has in mind is that what we would have before us is the document that if we're prepared to vote on it and accept it and if the four of us uh, vote yes it should go on the ballot yeah and, and let me be clear I, I have no preference one way or the other I just for as Commissioner her alluded to we have a number of other things on our work plan and what I'm trying to anticipate is to the extent the amount of work that this will require and to the extent that we will have to be pushing other things back that were otherwise contemplated in the work plan that's that's simply what I'm asking about yeah okay a work plan that we approved two months ago three months ago for the year <clears throat> all right item number six Discussion and possible action regarding complaints received or initiated by the Ethics Commission concerning one California Government Code Section 84104 and San Francisco Campaign and Governmental Conduct Code Section 1.109A, failure to maintain required committee records. California Government Code Section 84300, paren B, close paren, making cash expenditures and San Francisco Campaign and Government Conduct Code Section 1.114A, exceeding contribution limits, and two, San Francisco Campaign and Governmental Conduct Code Section 2.100, paren C, close paren, failure to disclose lobbying contacts, possible closed session, and first public matters on all matters pertaining to agenda item six, including whether to meet in closed session. Any public comment? Hear, hearing none, uh, do I hear a motion as to whether to assert the attorney client privilege of meet in closed session under charter section C 3.699 Dash 13 Brown Act section 54956.9 and Sunshine Ordinance section 67.10 paren D close paren to discuss anticipated litigation as plaintiff. So moved. Second. All right. Public comment. All right. Call the question. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? carried unanimously five we will go into closed session mr. chair let me just state for the record also publicly there are two matters in the second matter I will be recusing myself and will not be right. participating
SFGovTV, San Francisco Government Television. SFO continues to upgrade its passenger terminals to deliver an exceptional experience for airport guests. In this episode, we'll take a look at the exciting renovation happening in Terminal 3 at Boarding Area E. We'll talk to the people involved, take a look at the construction site, and give you a glimpse at the finished product. I'm Doug Yakel, and this is Inside SFO. When Terminal 2 opened in April of 2011, it set a new standard for the guest experience at SFO. The renovation of Boarding Area E continues this trend while standing on its own with new unique features and amenities. Elevating the passenger experience, I think we did such a, such a great job with Terminal 2, you know, one of the most successful projects we've ever done. And so I'm excited about taking that to the next level. We have a very creative team of engineers and architects and builders and project managers and staff involved in this. It's complete participation by the entire airport community to deliver this project to that exceptional level. Terminal 2 set the bar, but I really wanted to focus on the passenger experience, make sure that uh, passengers had a great waiting experience while they're on E. When you come into this area, the one thing you notice right away is how much more space there is. The ceilings are so much higher, the terminal is so much wider, but the thing passengers are going to enjoy the most is that huge picture window at the end of the concourse. But designing a great terminal is about more than just having space and a choice view. It's also about providing information that guests need. During the visioning of boarding area E, there was a thought that at the entrance to it, there should be an information terrace. The information terrace, I think, is going to be exciting for us, where you can personalize your journey within the boarding area. And so you can stand in one location, understand exactly what's inside the boarding area. 
When it opens in early 2014, Boarding Area E will continue the themes that began in Terminal 2, environmentally sustainable design, locally sourced concessions, and an enhanced experience for airport guests. That's a wrap for this episode. Thanks very much for watching, and we look forward to seeing you again on the next edition of Inside SFO. Hey San Francisco, it's Halili bringing you this week's local events and activities to enjoy on the cheap. When the San Francisco weather is particularly pleasant like this, it's time to get off the beaten path and explore the city while it's hot. Get it in before the fog rolls in. This is the Weekly Buzz. On Wednesday, May 27th at 1230, explore the Mission Bay neighborhood with a free tour of the new UCSF Biotech campus. Learn about translational research, view some world-class contemporary art, and see what's happening in this up-and-coming neighborhood. The starting point for UCSF Mission Bay from Shells to Cells tour is 1653rd Street. Get yourself on down to the waterfront campus of Fort Mason this Friday for Off the Grid, the weekly outdoor food truck bonanza. Get your groove on to DJs from 5 to 7.30 and live bands from 8 to 10 while you nosh on tasty treats from 17 food trucks, 11 food tents, and two dessert carts. The San Francisco Public Utilities Commission invites you to take a free tour of the city's wastewater treatment plant to find out how your sewer system works. Learn about the history of wastewater treatment in San Francisco, tips on preventing pollution of our bay and ocean, and best of all, you'll get to go behind the scenes to see how this vital piece of infrastructure works. The tour is free with RSVP. And that, my friends, is the Weekly Buzz. For more information on these events and more, visit us at sfgovtv.org and click on Weekly Buzz. And while you're on the web, check out our YouTube page and scroll through some of our original programs. Thanks so much for watching. My first coffee memory, I remember having coffee with my grandma. In the old days, my grandma and her friends get together, all they have is coffee. And I was six or seven, and I think that she, she gave me a spoonful, and I made a face, but it was a good face. <laughs> when I was young, I always had a passion for coffee, because I used to drink it, and it used to do something to my body. I've been doing coffee since I was 17, so that's pretty much all I know. It's like really the only thing I'm good at. So, <laughs> And I was trying to find my way through school. I just got a job at the local coffee shop. And I worked it and it was great. I enjoyed it and decided that I wanted to do that for the rest of my life. And I think that mostly it was because I had started looking into what the process of the coffee and where it came from and that it, you know, it's like, where, where do these little beans come from? You know, oh, they're not actually beans, they're little seeds. Oh, they come from a fruit. Coffee stayed with me since I was a kid and I grew up. I said one day I'm gonna open coffee shops all over. From the 70s to 98, work at it. In 98, I spent two years, I visited over 1,100 coffee shops, maybe a lot more, just to see why people go to coffee shops. We source the beans from all over the world. We source them from Central America, South America, East Africa, Tokyo, and other places. What I wanted to do when I started Four Barrel Coffee was really get into every aspect of the sourcing coffee and, and the processing and the agronomy and everything else, realizing that there's multiple steps to making a great cup of coffee and that all the way along they have to be executed perfectly, otherwise it won't shine in the end. And we do a lot of lighter roast and that's mostly because with the quality of coffee that we source, once you roast it into the dark roast level, it really homogenizes with the lower quality coffee, so you can't really taste the difference at that point. See, one thing about my coffee, they all were special blends that I create. I spent seven years in one blend. I call it the Sora. Sora means it's my treasure. Each means they were all chosen, all blend with each other, different culture. Beans is like people, people, beans. And these people give me a name and reputation that I cannot buy. Only happen once in a lifetime to people, to us. 
people love you, your clientele love you, they take you to the moon. And that's what happened to us. But then I really fell in love with coffee when I was a teenager and hanging out at the local coffee shop. You know, back then it was terrible. It was terrible coffee. It was mostly cream and sugar. But the community aspect I really enjoyed. I think it's really important for people to just have a place where they can just show up and, and talk to their neighbors and their friends and to reconnect and find like-minded people. You're surrounded with all this beautiful community. I like my city. I love my city. San Francisco has good name, good reputation. And it has every culture in this planet living in San Francisco. It's a small city, seven by seven, but it's huge. We need to have the same motion again in open session that we just had in closed session. Right. All right, uh, we are now in open session and The question is whether or not uh, the Ethics Commission was to dis move, will move to disclose its closed session deliberation. And as I, do I call them another vote? Well, somebody needs to make the motion and second it. Not disclose? I move to not disclose. What was second. discussed in closed session? Any public comment? Hearing none, uh, call the question. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Hearing none, it carried 5 0. <clears throat> Item number seven discussion and possible action on the Commission's April 27, 2015 draft meeting minutes. Any commissioners have any comments on the minutes? Any public comment? David Pilpel speaking as an individual. Um, on page six of the um, minutes, motion 15042703, the motion to recuse uh, Commissioner Keene. I believe that um, a member of the body votes on a motion to recuse, and so I believe Commissioner Keene should be uh, recorded as voting for that motion, and then on the subsequent motion on the merits, Commissioner Keene is properly listed as being recused. People are thinking about this. Um, Sorry. That's on page yeah. six. Um, and also on page 10, it's a, a minor thing uh, under item 10, the items for future meetings. I asked if the next meeting would be moved to a different day to the, due to the Memorial Day holiday. I believe at the meeting, it was, there was a response saying that the meeting would be moved to tonight, Wednesday, and that the uh, meeting would not be held on the regular day. Somebody could add a sentence to clarify. It's not that important. Thank you. Your motion to adopt the minutes has... So moved. All the question, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Hearing none. Minutes are approved 5-0. Next item. <coughs> Discussion of the executive director's report. Um, just a couple of highlights. Um, as of yesterday, this month, um, since the last meeting, I should say, um, we've had five interested persons meetings, including the two about the executive director search. Um, one about the uh, expansion of the f electronic filing of Form 700s, uh, uh, the financial disclosure forms. And the fifth one was about the candidate controlled ballot measure um, committee's uh, actions that we're considering. Um, I just wanted to point out the 21 um, records requests we've gotten since the last meeting, since the start of April. Some of them have been extensive, and, and this is a very busy time for the staff the last couple of months. Um, and just to let the commission know, these are taking up time. Um, and and just, just make you aware that there's a lot going on, and you know the staff is working hard. And there's one last one I'm going to defer to the deputy director. 
Thank you. I just want to point out that we have uh, included, per um, Commissioner Hur's request, a calendar at the end of the ED report, which shows the project calendar. Um, and uh, you'll notice that the Form 700 electronic filing regulation was scheduled for this month. Um, we uh, put it, the uh, ch uh, chair decided to put it over one month, primarily due to the length or the contemplated length of the agenda. Um, uh, when we do that, so uh, we anticipate hearing that in June. We also will have our special meeting on June 5th regarding candidate controlled committees um, and then anticipate further um, uh, meetings having to do with candidate controlled committees after that, depending on um, uh, staff resources. Any public comment? David Pilpel speaking as an individual. Um, two items under item seven, the statements of economic interest. The second paragraph uh, indicates that 55% of filers have filed their Sunshine Ordinance declaration. That seems low and troubling, and I hope staff will take efforts to improve that in the next month. Um, and I'm not sure that I understand the 25% have filed their certificate of ethics training. I recall that that's both, that's actually an AB 1234 state law requirement over a two-year period. So I'm not sure if that's only 25%. I'm not sure what the reporting period is, is there because one has two years from the last time that they completed ethics training to, to refile. Anyway, if staff can just review those, those two figures and ensure that they're accurate and hopefully people will comply and file. Um, and also on the project calendar, although that was, I understand, adopted by the commission two months ago, and I very much appreciate that it's in the ED's report, I hope that this will be more of a living document, so each month this could be updated for what's actually been done, what's coming up in the next few months, what other items you add, either now or on the, the next agenda item, so that things are sort of captured here, and that as things have completed, that they sort of walk off and that other things get uh, added. Anyway, um, this is really an improvement. Thank you very much. And I do um, recognize that staff have been doing a lot of work recently. I think I was at three of the five interested persons meetings and there, there's just a lot going on right now. So thank you all for your time. Item nine, items for future meetings. Commissioner uh, Herr. If, if possible, in the next packet when the uh, revised legislation is included, I think it would be helpful to have the definitions of expenditure lobbyists that are used by other jurisdictions just so that we can sort of see how, how it's done in other places. As I mentioned earlier, I would request that on the agenda that goes out for June 5th, that there just be an item for an update on the recruit recruiting process, uh, just keeping the public advised as to where we are. Do I hear a motion to adjourn? Public comment. Pardon me? Public. Oh yeah, public comment. Hearing none. I hear a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Hearing all opposed? One opposed? We will stand adjourned. <laughs>